Beyond Syntax The Usher I was in Don Juan's house in Sonora, sound asleep in my bed, when he woke me up. I had stayed up practically all night, mulling over concepts that he had explained to me. You have rested enough, he said firmly, almost gruffly, as he shook me by the shoulders. Don't indulge in being fatigued. Your fatigue is, more than fatigue, a desire not to be bothered. Something in you resents being bothered. But it's most important that you exacerbate that part of you until it breaks down. Let's go for a hike. Don Juan was right. There was some part of me that resented immensely being bothered. I wanted to sleep for days and not think about Don Juan's sorcery concepts anymore. Thoroughly against my will, I got up and followed him. Don Juan had prepared a meal, which I devoured as if I hadn't eaten for days, and then we walked out of the house and headed east, toward the mountains. I had been so dazed that I hadn't noticed that it was early morning until I saw the sun, which was right above the eastern range of mountains. I wanted to comment to Don Juan that I had slept all night without moving, but he hushed me. He said that we were going to go on an expedition to the mountains to search for specific plants. What are you going to do with the plants you are going to collect, Don Juan? I asked him as soon as we had started off. They are not for me, he said with a grin. They are for a friend of mine, a botanist and pharmacist. He makes potions with them. Is he a yaki, Don Juan? Does he live here in Sonora? I asked. No, he isn't a yaki, and he doesn't live here in Sonora. You meet him someday. Is he a sorcerer, Don Juan? Yes, he is, he replied dryly. I asked him then if I could take some of the plants to be identified at the botanical garden at UCLA. Surely, surely, he said. I had found out in the past that whenever he said surely, he didn't mean it. It was obvious that he had no intention whatsoever of giving me any specimens for identification. I became very curious about his sorcerer friend, and asked him to tell me more about him, perhaps describe him, telling me where he lived and how he got to meet him. Whoa, 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 whoa. Don Juan said, as if I were a horse. Hold it, hold it. Who are you? Professor Lorica? Do you want to study his cognitive system? We went deep into the arid foothills. Don Juan walked steadily for hours. I thought that the task of the day was going to be just to walk. He finally stopped and sat down on the shaded side of the foothills. It is time that you start on one of the biggest projects of sorcery, Don Juan said. What is this project of sorcery that you're talking about, Don Juan? I inquired. It's called the recapitulation, he said. The old sorcerers used to call it recounting the events of your life, and for them, it started as a simple technique, a device to aid them in remembering what they were doing and saying to their disciples. For their disciples, the technique had the same value, it allowed them to remember what their teachers had said and done to them. It took terrible social upheavals, like being conquered and vanquished several times, before the old sorcerers realized that their technique had far-reaching effects. Are you referring, Don Juan, to the Spanish conquest? I asked. No, he said. That was just the icing on the cake. There were other upheavals before that, more devastating. When the Spaniards got here, the old sorcerers didn't exist any longer. The disciples of those who had survived other upheavals were very cagey by then. They knew how to take care of themselves. It is that new crop of sorcerers who renamed the old sorcerers technique recapitulation. There's an enormous premium on time, he continued. For sorcerers in general, time is of the essence. The challenge I am faced with is that in a very compact unit of time I must cram into you everything there is to know about sorcery as an abstract proposition, but in order to do that I have to build the necessary space in you. What space? What are you talking about, Don Juan? The premise of sorcerers is that in order to bring something in, there must be a space to put it in, he said. If you are filled to the brim with the items of everyday life, there's no space for anything new. That space must be built. Do you see what I mean? 
the sorcerers of olden times believed that the recapitulation of your life made that space. It does, and much more, of course. The way sorcerers perform the recapitulation is very formal, he went on. It consists of writing a list of all the people they have met, from the present to the very beginning of their lives. Once they have that list, they take the first person on it and recollect everything they can about that person. And I mean everything, every detail. It's better to recapitulate from the present to the past, because the memories of the present are fresh, and in this manner, the recollection ability is honed. What practitioners do is to recollect and breathe. They inhale slowly and deliberately, fanning the head from right to left, in a barely noticeable swing, and exhale in the same fashion. He said that the inhalations and exhalations should be natural, if they were too rapid, one would enter into something that he called tiring breaths, breaths that required slower breathing afterward in order to calm down the muscles. And what do you want me to do, Don Juan, with all this? I asked. You begin making your list today, he said. Divide it by years, by occupations, arrange it in any order you want to, but make it sequential, with the most recent person first, and end with mommy and daddy. And then, remember everything about them. No more ado than that. As you practice, you will realize what you're doing. On my next visit to his house, I told Don Juan that I had been meticulously going through the events of my life and that it was very difficult for me to adhere to his strict format and follow my list of persons one by one. Ordinarily, my recapitulation took me every which way. I let the events decide the direction of my recollection. What I did, which was volitional, was to adhere to a general unit of time. For instance, I had begun with the people in the anthropology department, but I let my recollection pull me to anywhere in time from the present to the day I started attending school at UCLA. I told Don Juan that an odd thing I'd found out, which I had completely forgotten, was that I had no idea that UCLA existed until one night when my girlfriend's roommate from college came to Los Angeles and we picked her up at the airport. She was going to study musicology at UCLA. Her plane arrived in the early evening and she asked me if I could take her to the campus so she could take a look at the place where she was going to spend the next four years of her life. I knew where the campus was, for I had driven past its entrance on Sunset Boulevard endless times on my way to the beach. I had never been on the campus, though. It was during the semester break. The few people that we found directed us to the music department. The campus was deserted but what I witnessed subjectively was the most exquisite thing I have ever seen. It was a delight to my eyes. The buildings seemed to be alive with some energy of their own. What was going to be a very cursory visit to the music department turned out to be a gigantic tour of the entire campus. I fell in love with UCLA. I mentioned to Don Juan that the only thing that marred my ecstasy was my girlfriend's annoyance at my insistence on walking through the huge campus. What the hell could there be in here? She yelled at me in protest. It's as if you have never seen a university campus in your life. You've seen one, you've seen them all. I think you're just trying to impress my friend with your sensitivity. I wasn't and I vehemently told them that I was genuinely impressed by the beauty of my surroundings. I sensed so much hope in those buildings, so much promise, and yet I couldn't express my subjective state. I have been in school nearly all my life, my girlfriend said through clenched teeth, and I'm sick and tired of it. Nobody's going to find shit in here. All you find is guff, and they don't even prepare you to meet your responsibilities in life. When I mentioned that I would like to attend school here, she became even more furious. Get a job. She screamed. Go and meet life from 8 to 5, and cut the crap. That's what life is, a job from 8 to 5, 40 hours a week. See what it does to you. Look at me I'm super educated now, and I'm not fit for a job. All I knew was that I had never seen a place so beautiful. I made a promise then that I would go to school at UCLA, no matter what, come hell or high water. My desire had everything to do with me, 
and yet it was not driven by the need for immediate gratification. It was more in the realm of awe. I told Don Juan that my girlfriend's annoyance had been so jarring to me that it forced me to look at her in a different light, and that to my recollection, that was the first time ever that a commentary had aroused such a deep reaction in me. I saw facets of character in my girlfriend that I hadn't seen before, facets that scared me stiff. I think I judged her terribly, I said to Don Juan. After our visit to the campus, we drifted apart. It was as if UCLA had come between us like a wedge. I know that it's stupid to think this way. It isn't stupid, Don Juan said. It was a perfectly valid reaction. While you were walking on the campus, I am sure that you had about with intent. You intended being there, and anything that was opposed to it you had to let go. But don't overdo it, he went on. The touch of warrior travelers is very light, although it is cultivated. The hand of a warrior traveler begins as a heavy, gripping, iron hand but becomes like the hand of a ghost, a hand made of gossamer. Warrior travelers leave no marks, no tracks. That's the challenge for warrior travelers. Don Juan's comments made me sink into a deep, morose state of recriminations against myself, for I knew, from the little bit of my recounting, that I was extremely heavy-handed, obsessive, and domineering. I told Don Juan about my ruminations. The power of the recapitulation, Don Juan said, is that it stirs up all the garbage of our lives and brings it to the surface. Then Don Juan delineated the intricacies of awareness and perception, which were the basis of the recapitulation. He began by saying that he was going to present an arrangement of concepts that I should not take as sorcerer's theories under any conditions, because it was an arrangement formulated by the shamans of ancient Mexico as a result of seeing energy directly as it flows in the universe. He warned me that he would present the units of this arrangement to me without any attempt at classifying them or ranking them by any predetermined standard. I'm not interested in classifications, he went on. You have been classifying everything all your life. Now you are going to be forced to stay away from classifications. The other day, when I asked you if you knew anything about clouds, you gave me the names of all the clouds and the percentage of moisture that one should expect from each one of them. You are a veritable weather man. But when I asked you if you knew what you could do with the clouds personally, you had no idea what I was talking about. Classifications have a world of their own, he continued. After you begin to classify anything, the classification becomes alive, and it rules you. But since classifications never started as energy-giving affairs, they always remain like dead logs. They are not trees, they are merely logs. He explained that the sorcerers of ancient Mexico saw that the universe at large is composed of energy fields in the form of luminous filaments. They saw zillions of them, wherever they turned to see. They also saw that those energy fields arrange themselves into currents of luminous fibers, streams that are constant, perennial forces in the universe, and that the current or stream of filaments that is related to the recapitulation was named by those sorcerers the Dark Sea of Awareness, and also the Eagle. He stated that those sorcerers also found out that every creature in the universe is attached to the dark sea of awareness at a round point of luminosity that was apparent when those creatures were perceived as energy. On that point of luminosity, which the sorcerers of ancient Mexico called the assemblage point, Don Juan said that perception was assembled by a mysterious aspect of the dark sea of awareness. Don Juan asserted that on the assemblage point of human beings, zillions of energy fields from the universe at large, in the form of luminous filaments, converge and go through it. These energy fields are converted into sensory data, and the sensory data is then interpreted and perceived as the world we know. Don Juan further explained that what turns the luminous fibers into sensory data is the dark sea of awareness. Sorcerers see this transformation and call it the glow of awareness a sheen that extends like a halo around the assemblage point. He warned me then that he was going to make a statement which, in the understanding of sorcerers, was central to comprehending the scope of the recapitulation. Putting an enormous emphasis on his words, 
he said that what we call the senses in organisms is nothing but degrees of awareness. He maintained that if we accept that the senses are the dark sea of awareness, we have to admit that the interpretation that the senses make of sensory data is also the dark sea of awareness. He explained at length that to face the world around us in the terms that we do is the result of the interpretation system of mankind with which every human being is equipped. He also said that every organism in existence has to have an interpretation system that permits it to function in its surroundings. The sorcerers who came after the apocalyptic upheavals I told you about, he continued, saw that at the moment of death, the dark sea of awareness sucked in, so to speak, through the assemblage point, the awareness of living creatures. They also saw that the dark sea of awareness had a moment's, let's say, hesitation when it was faced with sorcerers who had done a recounting of their lives. Unbeknownst to them, some had done it so thoroughly that the dark sea of awareness took their awareness in the form of their life experiences, but didn't touch their life force. Sorcerers had found out a gigantic truth about the forces of the universe, the dark sea of awareness wants only our life experiences, not our life force. The premises of Don Juan's elucidation were incomprehensible to me. Or perhaps it would be more accurate to say that I was vaguely and yet deeply cognizant of how functional the premises of his explanation were. Sorcerers believe, Don Juan went on, that as we recapitulate our lives, all the debris, as I told you, comes to the surface. We realize our inconsistencies, our repetitions but something in us puts up a tremendous resistance to recapitulating. Sorcerers say that the road is free only after a gigantic upheaval, after the appearance on our screen of the memory of an event that shakes our foundations with its terrifying clarity of detail. It's the event that drags us to the actual moment that we lived it. Sorcerers call that event the usher, because from then on every event we touch on is relived, not merely remembered. Walking is always something that precipitates memories, Don Juan went on. The sorcerers of ancient Mexico believed that everything we live we store as a sensation on the backs of the legs. They considered the backs of the legs to be the warehouse of man's personal history. So, let's go for a walk in the hills now. We walked until it was almost dark. I think I have made you walk long enough, Don Juan said when we were back at his house to have you ready to begin this sorcerer's maneuver of finding an usher, an event in your life that you will remember with such clarity that it will serve as a spotlight to illuminate everything else in your recapitulation with the same, or comparable, clarity. Do what sorcerers call recapitulating pieces of a puzzle. Something will lead you to remember the event that will serve as your usher. He left me alone, giving me one last warning. Give it your best shot, he said do your best. I was extremely silent for a moment, perhaps due to the silence around me. I experienced, then, a vibration, a sort of jolt in my chest. I had difficulty breathing, but suddenly something opened up in my chest that allowed me to take a deep breath, and a total view of a forgotten event of my childhood burst into my memory, as if it had been held captive and was suddenly released. I was at my grandfather's studio where he had a billiard table, and I was playing billiards with him. I was almost nine years old then. My grandfather was quite a skillful player, and compulsively he had taught me every play he knew until I was good enough to have a serious match with him. We spent endless hours playing billiards. I became so proficient at it that one day I defeated him. From that day on, he was incapable of winning. Many a time I deliberately threw the game just to be nice to him, but he knew it and would become furious with me. Once, he got so upset that he hit me on the top of the head with a cue. To my grandfather's chagrin and delight, by the time I was nine years old, I could make carom after carom without stopping. He became so frustrated and impatient in a game with me once that he threw down his cue and told me to play by myself. My compulsive nature made it possible for me to compete with myself and work the same play on and on until I got it perfectly. One day, a man notorious in town for his gambling connections, the owner of a billiards house, came to visit my grandfather. 
They were talking and playing billiards as I happened to enter the room. I instantly tried to retreat, but my grandfather grabbed me and pulled me in. This is my grandson, he said to the man. Very pleased to meet you, the man said. He looked at me sternly, and then extended his hand, which was the size of the head of a normal person. I was horrified. His enormous burst of laughter told me that he was cognizant of my discomfort. He told me that his name was Falilo Queroga, and I mumbled my name. He was very tall, and extremely well-dressed. He was wearing a double-breasted blue pinstriped suit with beautifully tapered trousers. He must have been in his early fifties then, but he was trim and fit except for a slight bulge in his midsection. He wasn't fat, he seemed to cultivate the look of a man who is well-fed and is not in need of anything. Most of the people in my hometown were gaunt. They were people who labored hard to earn a living and had no time for niceties. Falilo Queroga appeared to be the opposite. His whole demeanor was that of a man who had time only for niceties. He was pleasant looking. He had a bland, well-shaven face with kind blue eyes. He had the air and the confidence of a doctor. People in my town used to say that he was capable of putting anyone at ease, and that he should have been a priest, a lawyer or a doctor instead of a gambler. They also used to say that he made more money gambling than all the doctors and lawyers in town put together made by working. His hair was black, and carefully combed. It was obviously thinning considerably. He tried to hide his receding hairline by combing his hair over his forehead. He had a square jaw and an absolutely winning smile. He had big, white teeth, which were well cared for the ultimate novelty in an area where tooth decay was monumental. Two other remarkable features of Falilo Queroga, for me, were his enormous feet and his handmade, black patent leather shoes. I was fascinated by the fact that his shoes didn't squeak at all as he walked back and forth in the room. I was accustomed to hearing my grandfather's approach by the squeak of the soles of his shoes. My grandson plays billiards very well, my grandfather said nonchalantly to Falilo Quiroga. Why don't I give him my cue and let him play with you while I watch? This child plays billiards? The big man asked my grandfather with a laugh. Oh, he does, my grandfather assured him. Of course, not as well as you do, Falilo. Why don't you try him? And to make it interesting for you, so you won't be patronizing my grandson, let's bet a little money. What do you say if we bet this much? He put a thick wad of crumpled up bills on the table and smiled at Falilo Queroga, shaking his head from side to side as if tearing the big man to take his bet. My oh my, that much, eh? Falilo Queroga said, looking at me questioningly. He opened his wallet in and pulled out some neatly folded bills. This, for me, was another surprising detail. My grandfather's habit was to carry his money in every one of his pockets, all crumpled up. When he needed to pay for something, he had to straighten out the bills in order to count them. Falilo Queroga didn't say it, but I knew that he felt like a highway robber. He smiled at my grandfather and, obviously out of respect for him, he put his money on the table. My grandfather, acting as the arbiter, set the game at a certain number of caroms and flipped a coin to see who would start first. Falilo Queroga won. You better give it all you have, without holding back, my grandfather urged him. Don't have any qualms about demolishing this twerp and winning my money. Falilo Queroga, following my grandfather's advice, played as hard as he was able but at one point he missed one carom by a hair. I took the cue. I thought I was going to faint, but seeing my grandfather's glee he was jumping up and down calmed me, and besides, it irked me to see Falilo Queroga about to split his sides laughing when he saw the way I held the cue. I couldn't lean over the table, as billiards is normally played, because of my height. But my grandfather, with painstaking patience and determination, had taught me an alternative way of playing. By extending my arm all the way back, I held the cue nearly above my shoulders, to the side. What does he do when he has to reach the middle of the table? Falilo Queroga asked, laughing. He hangs on the edge of the table, 
My grandfather said matter-of-factly. It's permissible, you know. My grandfather came to me and whispered through clenched teeth that if I tried to be polite and lose he was going to break all the cues on my head. I knew he didn't mean it, this was just his way of expressing his confidence in me. I won easily. My grandfather was delighted beyond description, but strangely enough, so was Falaloka Roga. He laughed as he went around the pool table, slapping its edges. My grandfather praised me to the skies. He revealed to Quiroga my best score, and joked that I had excelled because he had found the way to lure me to practice, coffee with Danish pastries. You don't say, you don't say? Quiroga kept repeating. He said goodbye, my grandfather picked up the bet money, and the incident was forgotten. My grandfather promised to take me to a restaurant and buy me the best meal in town, but he never did. He was very stingy. He was known to be a lavish spender only with women. Two days later, two enormous men affiliated with Falilo Quiroga came to me at the time that I got out from school and was leaving. Falilo Quiroga wants to see you, one of them said in a guttural tone. He wants you to go to his place and have some coffee and Danish pastries with him. If he hadn't said coffee and Danish pastries, I probably would have run away from them. I remembered then that my grandfather had told Falilo Quiroga that I would sell my soul for coffee and Danish pastries. I gladly went with them. However, I couldn't walk as fast as they did, so one of them, the one whose name was Guillermo Falcon, picked me up and cradled me in his huge arms. He laughed through crooked teeth. You better enjoy the ride, kid, he said. His breath was terrible. Have you ever been carried by anyone? Judging by the way you wriggle, never. He giggled grotesquely. Fortunately, Falilo Quiroga's place was not too far from the school. Mr. Falcon deposited me on a couch in an office. Falilo Quiroga was there, sitting behind a huge desk. He stood up and shook hands with me. He immediately had some coffee and delicious pastries brought to me, and the two of us sat there chatting amiably about my grandfather's chicken farm. He asked me if I would like to have more pastries, and I said that I wouldn't mind if I did. He laughed, and he himself brought me a whole tray of unbelievably delicious pastries from the next room. After I had veritably gorged myself, he politely asked me if I would consider coming to his billiards place in the wee hours of the night to play a couple of friendly games with some people of his choice. He casually mentioned that a considerable amount of money was going to be involved. He openly expressed his trust in my skill, and added that he was going to pay me, for my time and my effort, a percentage of the winning money. He further stated that he knew the mentality of my family, they would have found it improper that he give me money, even though it was pay. So he promised to put the money in the bank in a special account for me, or more practical yet, he would cover any purchase that I made in any of the stores in town or the food I consumed in any restaurant in town. I didn't believe a word of what he was saying. I knew that Falilo Quiroga was a crook, a racketeer. I liked, however, the idea of playing billiards with people I didn't know, and I struck a bargain with him. Will you give me some coffee and Danish pastries like the ones you gave me today? I said. Of course, my boy, he replied. If you come to play for me. I will buy you the bakery. I will have the baker bake them just for you. Take my word. I warned Falilo Quiroga that the only drawback was my incapacity to get out of my house, I had too many ants who watched me like hawks, and besides, my bedroom was on the second floor. That's no problem, Falilo Quiroga assured me. You're quite small. Mr. Falcon will catch you if you jump from your window into his arms. He's as big as a house. I recommend that you go to bed early tonight. Mr. Falcon will wake you up by whistling and throwing rocks at your window. You have to watch out, though. He's an impatient man. I went home in the midst of the most astounding excitation. I couldn't go to sleep. I was quite awake when I heard Mr. Falcon whistling and throwing small pebbles against the glass panes of the window. I opened the window. Mr. Falcon was right below me, on the street. 
jump into my arms, kid, he said to me in a constricted voice, which he tried to modulate into a loud whisper. If you don't aim at my arms, I'll drop you and you'll die. Remember that. Don't make me run around. Just aim at my arms. Jump. Jump. I did, and he caught me with the ease of someone catching a bag of cotton. He put me down and told me to run. He said that I was a child awakened from a deep sleep, and that he had to make me run so I would be fully awake by the time I got to the billiards house. I played that night with two men, and I won both games. I had the most delicious coffee and pastries that one could imagine. Personally, I was in heaven. It was around 7 in the morning when I returned home. Nobody had noticed my absence. It was time to go to school. For all practical purposes, everything was normal except for the fact that I was so tired that I couldn't keep my eyes open all day. From that day on, Falaloqueroga sent Mr. Falcon to pick me up two or three times a week, and I won every game that he made me play. And faithful to his promise, he paid for anything that I bought, including meals at my favorite Chinese restaurant, where I used to go daily. Sometimes, I even invited my friends, whom I mortified no end by running out of the restaurant screaming when the waiter brought the bill. They were amazed at the fact that they were never taken to the police for consuming food and not paying for it. What was an ordeal for me was that I had never conceived of the fact that I would have to contend with the hopes and expectations of all the people who bet on me. The ordeal of ordeals, however, took place when a crack player from a nearby city challenged Falaloqueroga and backed his challenge with a giant bet. The night of the game was an inauspicious night. My grandfather became ill and couldn't fall asleep. The entire family was in an uproar. It appeared that nobody went to bed. I doubted that I had any possibility of sneaking out of my bedroom, but Mr. Falcon's whistling and the pebbles hitting the glass of my window were so insistent that I took a chance and jumped from my window into Mr. Falcon's arms. It seemed that every male in town had congregated at the billiards place. Anguished faces silently begged me not to lose. Some of them and boldly assured me that they had bet their houses and all their belongings. One man, in a half-joking tone, said that he had bet his wife, if I didn't win, he would be a cuckold that night, or a murderer. He didn't specify whether he meant he would kill his wife in order not to be a cuckold, or me, for losing the game. Falaloqueroga paced back and forth. He had hired a masseur to massage me. He wanted me relaxed. The masseur put hot towels on my arms and wrists and cold towels on my forehead. He put on my feet the most comfortable, soft shoes that I had ever worn. They had hard, military heels and arch supports. Falaloqueroga even outfitted me with a beret to keep my hair from falling in my face, as well as a pair of loose overalls with a belt. Half of the people around the billiard table were strangers from another town. They glared at me. They gave me the feeling that they wanted me dead. Falaloqueroga flipped a coin to decide who would go first. My opponent was a Brazilian of Chinese descent, young, round-faced, very spiffy and confident. He started first, and he made a staggering amount of caroms. I knew by the color of his face that Falaloqueroga was about to have a heart attack, and so were the other people who had bet everything they had on me. I played very well that night. And as I approached the number of caroms that the other man had made, the nervousness of the ones who had bet on me reached its peak. Falaloqueroga was the most hysterical of them all. He yelled at everybody and demanded that someone open the windows because the cigarette smoke made the air unbreathable for me. He wanted the masseur to relax my arms and shoulders. Finally, I had to stop everyone, and in a real hurry, I made the eight caroms that I needed to win. The euphoria of those who had bet on me was indescribable. I was oblivious to all that, for it was already morning and they had to take me home in a hurry. My exhaustion that day knew no limits. Very obligingly, Falaloqueroga didn't send for me for a whole week. However, one afternoon, Mr. Falcon picked me up from school and took me to the billiards house. Falaloqueroga was extremely serious. He didn't even offer me coffee or Danish pastries. 
He sent everybody out of his office and got directly to the point. He pulled his chair close to home. I have put a lot of money in the bank for you, he said very solemnly. I am true to what I promised you. I give you my word that I will always look after you. You know that. Now, if you do what I am going to tell you to do, you will make so much money that you won't have to work a day in your life. I want you to lose your next game by one carom. I know that you can do it. But I want you to miss by only a hair. The more dramatic, the better. I was dumbfounded. All of this was incomprehensible to me. Falaloqueroga repeated his request and further explained that he was going to bet anonymously all he had against me, and that that was the nature of our new deal. Mr. Falcon has been guarding you for months, he said. All I need to tell you is that Mr. Falcon uses all his force to protect you, but he could do the opposite with the same strength. Falaloqueroga's threat couldn't have been more obvious. He must have seen in my face the horror that I felt for he relaxed and laughed. Oh, but don't you worry about things like that, he said reassuringly, because we are brothers. This was the first time in my life that I had been placed in an untenable position. I wanted with all my might to run away from Falaloqueroga, from the fear that he had evoked in me. But at the same time, and with equal force, I wanted to stay, I wanted the ease of being able to buy anything I wanted from any store and above all, the ease of being able to eat at any restaurant of my choice, without paying. I was never confronted, however, with having to choose one or the other. Unexpectedly, at least for me, my grandfather moved to another area, quite distant. It was as if he knew what was going on, and he sent me ahead of everyone else. I doubted that he actually knew what was taking place. It seemed that sending me away was one of his usual intuitive actions. Don Juan's return brought me out of my recollection. I had lost track of time. I should have been famished but I wasn't hungry at all. I was filled with nervous energy. Don Juan lit a kerosene lantern and hung it from a nail on the wall. Its dim light cast strange, dancing shadows in the room. It took a moment for my eyes to adjust to the semi-darkness. I entered then into a state of profound sadness. It was a strangely detached feeling a far-reaching longing that came from that semi-darkness, or perhaps from the sensation of being trapped. I was so tired that I wanted to leave, but at the same time, and with the same force, I wanted to stay. Don Juan's voice brought me a measure of control. He appeared to know the reason for and the depth of my turmoil, and modulated his voice to fit the occasion. The severity of his tone helped me to gain control over something that could easily have turned into a hysterical reaction to fatigue and mental stimulation. To recount events is magical for sorcerers, he said. It isn't just telling stories. It is seeing the underlying fabric of events. This is the reason recounting is so important and vast. At his request, I told Don Juan the event I had recollected. How appropriate, he said and chuckled with delight. The only commentary I can make is that warrior travelers roll with the punches. They go wherever the impulse may take them. The power of warrior travelers is to be alert, to get maximum effect from minimal impulse. And above all, their power lies in not interfering. Events have a force, a gravity of their own, and travelers are just travelers. Everything around them is for their eyes alone. In this fashion. Travelers construct the meaning of every situation, without ever asking how it happened this way or that way. Today, you remembered an event that sums up your total life, he continued. You are always faced with a situation that is the same as the one that you never resolved. You never really had to choose whether to accept or reject Falaloqueroga's crooked deal. Infinity always puts us in this terrible position of having to choose, he went on. We want infinity, but at the same time, we want to run away from it. You want to tell me to go and jump in a lake, but at the same time you are compelled to stay. It would be infinitely easier for you to just be compelled to stay, 